Hello everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Imperial British Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about the history of Ireland. Uh, we'll get into the actual introduction to the podcast in a moment, but before we get into the podcast, there's something I want to talk about. The actual discussion today is on the history of Ireland, but we'll have another one uh, in about a week's time where Assassin and I are going to discuss the policies of the Home Rule League, because that's what today is about. It's a uh, discussion because we want you to know the history of the Irish should be a clear indicator that you need to support the Home Rule League. Specifically, we're going to talk about the atrocities the English have committed against the Irish, and we hope that that leads you to supporting Home Rule. But we don't want to only have a discussion today that doesn't tell you what we want in Home Rule. So before we begin the actual podcast, I'm going to go and just discuss a moment about Home Rule, uh, the Home Rule League, and our policies that we support. And I'm not going to explain them all, I'm just going to tell you what they are. If you want to know what they mean, if you don't, tune back next week because we'll discuss all of them and more. But the question I want to ask before we begin the podcast is, what do you think of when you hear Home Rule? For many of you, it's probably Irish separation, that's what you've seen on the group wall. You think that Home Rule would lead to Ireland leaving the Empire. That's just not true. No matter what the OUP says on the wall, their statements don't make fact no longer fact. Home Rule League will not lead to Irish separation. In fact, historically, the absence of Home Rule is what leads to separation. In order for you to understand Home Rule, let me give you a little bit of context. The Home Rule League is a political party in EBI, and in just a couple of weeks we're going to have an election. Our main platform can be summed up in two words. Irish excellence. We know that the Empire is important to Ireland, but we also believe that the Irish are valuable parts of the Empire. And most importantly, we believe that not everyone recognizes that fact. The Home Rule League supports mostly liberal policies, and when I say liberal, don't think modern-day American Democrats. This is the 1860s. Liberal is more libertarian, free trade, open economy, things like that. So we're not talking liberal as in Democrats. But the Home Rule League is allied with the Liberal Party, and we support them wholeheartedly. The only reason that we're in a separate party is the issue of Home Rule. Here are four things that it's important that you know that we support. Laissez-faire economics. That's an open economy. People are free to trade with who they wish, to have successes and failures without government intervention. Free trade, a part of laissez-faire economics, where trade is allowed from Ireland to any country they choose without British and English interference. Irish nationalism, no, that's not Irish superiority. We simply want Irish people to understand that their culture is vibrant and important and that they need to let it thrive. Our policies, like Gaelic language programs, things along those lines, will help support that. Finally, Home Rule. Home Rule does not mean separation. All Home Rule is, is an Irish Parliament, an Irish Assembly, which can vote on local Irish issues, taxes, trade, basic Irish trade at least, not major imperial trade, local laws, things that are not fair for the British to decide because they don't understand what the Irish need. Now, I didn't go into depth about those. I didn't explain them as well as I could have, and that's because I don't have time. We've got the podcast to get to, and I want you to be able to hear that. But what I will tell you is that everything that I just mentioned, it's all because the reason we support it. It's all because of what you're going to hear today in the podcast. The things that the English have done to the Irish are exactly why the Home Rule League supports what it does. Because we know the English simply can't understand the Irish plot. They don't understand the problems that the Irish face. Because of that, Home Rule is the only option. Now, that's all I have in the introduction and my little political ad. So I'm going to let you get into the podcast. I'll have one introduction when we start that. There will be a couple seconds, and then I'll start talking again to introduce to you our guests today and what we're going to do. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope that you'll tune back next week. This isn't just a political ad. This is a real historical lesson. This is something that really happened. And I think it's important to know, because the British are not squeaky clean. Their record is certainly not. And the Irish received the brunt of a lot of that treatment. So my hope is that once you've heard this ad and once you've heard this podcast, you will support the Home Rule League and that you'll vote for them in the EBI election because Home Rule is the only way to treat Ireland fairly. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Thanks. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're back with 
I suppose this is probably episode three of the EBI podcast. I don't really know. Uh, I don't know if it's fair to have the podcast with, with only my political party. So maybe we'll have some of the other, uh, the Orange Juniors come on later. But uh, in today's video, I have Assassin and Germany to talk about basically the history of Ireland. Uh, we're going to talk about pretty much from the very beginning of Irish and English uh, relationships or relations and head all the way down until up to about 1860, which would be modern day for the Home Rule League. Um, and then we have Germany here to ask any questions. We figured that a lot of you might have questions, so he's going to ask any that he thinks of on the spot. So we're going to start with that. Uh, not sure how long this will end up being, but hopefully we will uh, get everything set up and get everything done, and it'll be good. So let's go ahead and unmute, and we will get back to talking to them. Okay, we're good. Um, so basically... Uh, Germany, I already explained what you're here doing, and I already explained that Assassin's going to be here uh, assisting and, and also doing his own bits of research, that, or explaining his bits of research that he did. So I'm going to start, uh, just, I'm going to basically walk you guys through uh, the beginning of the relations of England and Ireland. So in 1169, and going on for a long time after that, Ireland was first invaded uh, by the Normans. Um, it was pretty one-sided. The Irish were not really equipped. They were basically separated from by long distances from each other, clan hierarchies. They were not a, a nation prepared for war. And the Normans obviously were. And in just a couple of years, they got a pretty strong hold over Ireland. Um, and that built up over a couple, like, you know, over a century. Uh, and up to about 1300, the Norman influence in Ireland got stronger and stronger and stronger. And in turn, the Gaelic people got weaker. Um, but from 1300 to about 1500, uh, things be kind of began looking up for the people of Ireland. Um, Gaelic chieftains began to rebel against English rule, uh, and realizing that they couldn't really beat armored knights, they'd already experienced that against the Normans. They burned uh, you know, bases and fortresses, they stole supplies, carried out sneak attacks, uh, and those tactics were pretty effective. And it led to a lot of land actually being taken back by the Gaelic people. Um, but the reason I wanted to talk about this is because when we tie things back into home rule and why it's so necessary, uh, Gaelic and Irish grievances against the English began all the way back in this time. Um, and that's not including the sentiment that I'm sure was already there from the fact that the Normans invaded them, but just issues and mistreatment by the English. Um, and just like in modern times, a lot of those problems are from farming. Uh, the Irish had been pushed back to a small amount of land in the west of Ireland. Um, and we see this all throughout history. The Pale that was in uh, eastern Eastern Ireland, Dublin, and a little bit into the north uh, was English. And the Irish got pushed back into the west. And essentially it forced them to be subsistence farmers. Uh, they couldn't grow crops to supply for everyone, just enough for themselves. And that obviously hurt them. We'll get back to that with the Great Famine. But there were lots of famines in Ireland before the Great Famine. Uh, even in the 1200s. And due to that, when a famine did happen, uh, the Irish couldn't sustain them all of their cells with just the food that they produced. And so they suffered every time there was a famine, or even just a bad harvest, which was relatively often a lot of Irish people would starve. Um, so, I mean, obviously, it's exactly what you would expect, which is when your people are starving because you've been pushed back by the English, you're going to resent the English. Uh, additionally, many of the Norman lords who had come in... Uh, you know, centuries ago, and taken land actually began to become embedded in Ireland and Gaelic culture. Uh, they bred into, like, the Gaelic peoples, uh, and in turn, they actually began to support the Irish in conflicts over the English government. Um, and as we've pretty much now come to expect, the English couldn't really stomach the idea of the Irish uniting or having power. Um, and so... In the 1300s, uh, there were laws passed, and one, another reason for the grievances, um, that disallowed people of English descent to speak the Irish language, to wear Irish clothes, or to intermarry with the Irish. And essentially, they were trying to just snuff out Gaelic culture. Um, luckily, it's hard to enforce these in the west of Ireland when English power really only stayed in the east. So it wasn't really widely followed, but what it really stands for is just a clear expression of of the English opinion of the Irish, even back in the 1300s. Um, but those grievances, along with wars that England was fighting uh, at the time, allowed Gaelic power to flourish in Ireland, uh, despite the best 
the hardest attempts of the English to stop it. Um, policies were put in place that ended up empowering Irishmen. Um, it happened in most of Ireland, except for, as I said, the Pale, um, which is mainly the land around Dublin, the southeast, but it does go a little bit to the north. Um, in 1530, uh, over the course of about two centuries, Ireland had begun increasing its its power and becoming a little bit more self-governing. Uh, but it was obviously still weak from the Norman Conquest. The people had been moved away from, I mean, displaced from their homes. And that's not something you're going to recover from in just a couple hundred years. I mean, that was thousands of years or hundreds of years that they had, not thousands, they had been there before that, that was just pretty much wiped out by the Normans. Um, so they were obviously still uh, discontent with what was happening. So in 1534, an earl named Thomas Kildare led a rebellion against the king from actually inside the Pale. Um, unfortunately, the rebellion failed, or fortunately, I suppose, from some people's views, but unfortunately, the rebellion failed and, uh, in fact, caused the king to spend more time looking into Irish issues. And this is where things really started going worse and worse and worse for the Irish because the Pale was pretty much the only place where English law was actually enforced. And although technically all of Ireland was under English control, it wasn't really looked after. Uh, but this turn King Henry VIII's eyes towards Ireland, um, officially declared King of Ireland by the Parliament in Ireland, um, in an attempt to restore some of the authority lost by the English over the last several centuries. Um, and most importantly, uh, the King decided to put in place policies that were meant to do away with Irish systems of government and like, the hierarchy of Irish importance. So they tried to do away with clans or clan chiefs and they wanted to bring the west of Ireland into the government of England, just like the Pale. Um, it was also uh, around 1530, the first time that English titles were ever granted in Ireland. So very obviously trying to assimilate Ireland to basically just be English. Uh, and you're going to see that over and over and over and over again throughout this entire lesson. As we get to like plantations and stuff, they're, it, it's very clear they were just trying to do away with Gaelic culture. Um, but, of course, as monarch, or monarchs change, um, policies change. So after Henry VIII's death, complications arose. Um, first of all, it's not easy to centralize the government of Ireland. Uh, most of the Irish were still, or the Gaelic people, were still very anti-England, especially in the West. Um, so there were a lot of rebellions uh, in the time following Henry's death. Um, but this wasn't for nothing, though. The Irish, even at this point, were being mistreated by the government, and it made the... The tensions even worse and worse. Um, English soldiers and administrators would kill local chiefs, local lords. Uh, they would seize land from the Irish people at this point. They would just, I mean, it was awful for the Irish. And in order to pacify the Irish, who were still trying to revolt, the English instilled martial law in a lot of places. So, you know, they would garrison English troops in rebellious areas and essentially give them the right to execute people without trial. So, as you would expect, this angered the Irish even more. Um... And this led to the beginning of plantations. Uh, plantations were areas of the country that were settled by English people. They would bring them over from England and Scotland uh, to bring in English culture, language, traditions. Uh, they were intensely loyal to the crown. Um, as I said, you're going to see this again and again. It was there to snuff out Irish culture. And we'll talk about more sp a specific uh, plantation in a little bit. Um, the English pretty much knew that you're not going to be able to subjugate the Irish if they still had a will to fight and a culture to believe in, so they pretty much moved to slowly destroy that. Um, and over the following years, they their work was efficient. Ireland was slowly, uh, and, and effective I should say, it was, it was slowly being brought under English rule. Um, plantations grew stronger, English culture essentially on par with Irish culture. Um, and freedoms of the Irish and the Catholics specifically... Uh, were restricted even more as the English power grew. James I barred Catholics from any public office. Uh, as you'd expect, this made people angrier and angrier, and that led to the Irish Rebellion of 1641. Um, they wanted about exactly what you would expect in a revolt. Uh, reversal of the plantations, send them back to England, more self-governance, the governance they had had in the 13 to 1500s that had been taken away. Um, so as the rebellion continued, support grew on both sides for war. The um, people on plantations were killed, uh, and because of that, Protestant, Irish, and the Englishmen there began to support the war. And the Irish obviously supported it, as, or the Catholic Irish supported it, as it was one of the first real major attempts to reclaim their homes. 
Um, and over the next 11 years following that, there were several civil wars fought by the Irish. Uh, eventually, in 1647, the Irish caught a break and won a major victory. But after winning that victory, the Irish split, essentially, uh, because they weren't sure what to do. So they be factions began to form. Um, and I'm dumbing all this down because the war is not as important at, for this discussion as the atrocities committed. So obviously there's lots of, uh, of intricacies of what happened. But essentially, factions be began amongst the Irish, and it allowed the parliamentarians, uh, the English, who were led by Oliver Cromwell, to mount an, an invasion of Ireland. Um, and Cromwell is a really important part of what we're going to talk about, and I think Assassin prepared for that better than I did. But So I'm going to let him talk about Cromwell and his invasion and the treatment of the soldiers. So, Assassin, if you want to go into that for a couple minutes, I think that would be, that would be good. So I didn't too, do too much research on the actual war itself, but what ended up happening is this Irish rebellion became a part of a much larger war in England, which was the uh, uh, the uh, sorry English Civil War. And essentially, it was there's a lot of issues going on in England, especially involving religion. Uh, prior to this, the Protestant Reformation uh, brought about a ton of Protestant support in England, and they viewed the Catholics as a huge threat to the empire. And so because of this, they saw the Irish uh, population uh, that was vastly majority Catholic as a huge threat to them. So their objective was to try to anglicize them. They wanted to try to, as you mentioned, destroy their culture, destroy their religion, because they wanted to ass essentially assimilate them into uh, uh, English culture. And so what ended up happening was England, Ireland was essentially treated like a colony for uh, much of uh, its history and still is essentially treated like it because they still don't have any rule over itself. Essentially starting in 1607, the Catholics of Ireland to represent the majority of the population have had zero control of the decision making of Ireland. And so what ended up happening after the Civil War in which Oliver Cromwell and his forces uh, ended up winning, and they eventually did restore the monarchy under James the, uh, sorry, sorry, under uh, Charles II, who will become important later. Uh, after uh, Parliament and the parliamentarians won, the first thing they did was they passed the Act for the Settlement of Ireland, which essentially was a punishment for those who rebelled against uh, England. So there was different punishments for different people, but essentially those who started the first rebellion were seen much differently than those who uh, participated in the later parts of the rebellion because they viewed the first rebellion as an actual rebellion, whereas uh, the second part was more of a continuation of the English Civil War. So anyone who fought in the early stages were either executed or lost all of their land to the English. And then leaders of the rebellion in general would lose two-thirds of their land, and those who were just simply bystanders who didn't show absolute affection to the side of the English uh, lost one-third of their land. Oh, it was truly... Oh, yep, go ahead, So, I mean, I kind of find one thing, more or less. I think that I find a lot of this is fairly similar to what happened in Scotland as well. So, um, would you say that, you know, the English would probably try and do this to everyone that they would um, go after? Because I know things like the Highland Clearances are a lot, uh, fairly similar to the, um, I forget what it was called, but when Necros talked about um, land being mostly redistributed to uh, Englishmen rather than being given to, um, Irish Catholics, and the same thing happened in Scotland, just for uh, different differing reasons. Um, but you know, would you think that the English would kind of be a dangerous force to have in any country that is slightly different than them or has a different culture than them, um, like Ireland or Scotland? It's definitely been a recurring trend, not just of England, but of any sort of colonizer or empire, where when they enter into the country, they essentially treat them as a colony, and they get extreme amounts of economic and political power within that country and keep the native population out of that power. And so they're able to instill their own cultures and values and give incentives for those people who convert to those uh, values and traditions uh, to gain even more power in their own country. And that's sort of, I go ahead, Necros. I, I wanna just throw in here, I, I'm not 100% versed on the Highland Clearances. Um, what I will say is, uh, the Highland Clearances were like, I mean, it, it, they call it like the eviction of the Gales, um, from what I from what I can see about it. 
Um, it says it was an eviction of a significant number of tenants in the Scottish Highlands uh, under like a need uh, for landlords to increase their income. So I would say the the glaring difference is that for the Scottish, although they were kicked out, it was on a tenant landlord relationship, which is obviously something we're going to talk about later because that was a problem in Ireland as well. Um, but it, I think the the major difference would be this was something that they had like a system they already had set up, um, and it, it is its own problem. But I would think that for the Irish, it wasn't a, a landlord kicking you out of land that that you had, you know, rented from him. This was your family and clan has owned this land for hundreds of years, but because we don't like your religion and you rebelled against our oppressive policies, we're just going to take it from you and give it to Englishmen. So Germany, you are right that it would the English were. Are, and are dangerous neighbors to have, uh, but I think that specific circumstance, it's probably a little more intense for the Irish, but that's also probably because Scotland at this point was already under a stronger rule by the English, so I have no idea what happened to Scotland uh, when they were in the same, like, I don't know as much as I probably should about Scottish history, so I can't tell you when they were at the same point as the Irish were, where we're talking about, if that same thing happened to them with losing their lands then, but this specific instance, I would say that it's probably more intense for the Irish, but from the same issue with the English, if that makes any I sense. Do. But but yes, I do see what you're talking about. But sorry, Saxon, you can continue. So actually, it's a good point, a good timing to mention the tenant system, because the act that I just mentioned essentially created the tenant system. Because while this wasn't the intention of the act, there was a separate clause that allowed those considered to be commissioners of Ireland to transplant farmers into a farm that would be considered of equal value, which may seem fair, but you also have to consider that, like Necro said, these people have been living on this land for generations. This was their land. They didn't want to leave it. And so what happened was the British commissioners demanded all Catholic Irish leave the land that they have and go into the western region of the country. Uh, now, the commissioners say that this was because of security reasons, because they didn't want the Irish to rebel again. They wanted to keep them contained. But it's also worth noting that this western part of the country that they were forced to, on threat of death, mind you, uh, to leave to was a very, very poor region of the country. And so this is where this act and this uh, clause is where we see start seeing insanely major land loss uh, by the Catholics to the Protestants. And so what ended up happening was the Catholics who were working that land, they didn't want to give up their land. They didn't want to leave. They didn't want to move. So they just ended up becoming tenants to the new owners. And this tenant system, uh, we'll definitely get into this a lot more later, but it, it was horrible for those who lived in it. It was absolutely oppressive and poverty inducing and is one of the biggest causes of poverty in Ireland. And so just to put this into perspective, before the Cromwell uh, invasion, Catholics held the vast majority of land in Ireland around 60%. But now Catholics by 1688, own just 22 percent of the land so now following off of this uh like i said the monarchy was restored by Char charles ii though assassin, this was with a lot more parliament control assassin i'm stay where you're at i want to add in a couple of statistics as well um about cromwell and then i'll let you continue on to charles um so as assassin said <clears throat> most of the irish land was taken um what also happened was thousands of irish people were sent to either the Caribbean or to like Virginia as indentured servants. So not only were the Irish displaced, a lot of them were sent away. Um, and the statistic I really want to get in, and this is the reason I stopped assassin, is because it's calculated that about 600,000 people died in Ireland between 1641 and 1653. And they say that about two thirds of those deaths were civilian. Um, and so this was not, this wasn't, you know, obviously from our stance, even the punishment that was brought upon the rebels was too much because they were trying to reclaim their land. But this wasn't just punishment from the rebels. If you want to say that that was justified, then I disagree, but you're allowed to say that. But this wasn't just the rebels being punished. This was, like I said, you know, two-thirds of 600,000 deaths were civilian. This was obviously a calculated attack, not just against Irish rebels, but against the Irish. Um, and... And the, yeah, the other statistic I have was exactly what Assassin said, that you know, they lost a major part of their land. So I just wanted to throw in that one statistic about how many people died, but you can continue down to like Charles and stuff. Uh, 
Yeah. And actually going off that, like Necro said, while the original act and goal was to punish the rebels, the act that I just mentioned where all the, the Catholics were forced to go to the western part of this country, this didn't affect the rebels, this affected every single Catholic landowner. Which is just unbelievable. But going off of this, yeah, like I said, uh, the monarchy would eventually be restored. Uh, but of course, they had much reduced powers because the parliamentarians won the Civil War and wanted to keep the monarchy in check. And so it was restored with Charles II. Uh, and he was actually, uh, I think Necros has a bit of research on the actually pro-Catholic policies that happened during this time period. Because also his brother, who would succeed him, was also openly Catholic. Which is very interesting, but of course this reign was uh, very short-lived. And because there's a lot of tension going on at this time period, because of religion, because of Catholic threats, and uh, the monarchy was seen as not doing enough to curb the Catholics, among many other reasons, but just for the point of, uh, point of this video. Well, we're just going to mention that part. But the uh, Glorious Rebellion of 1688 was sparked, uh, and it ended up putting, start, it started a, the William Knight War, which puts uh, William of Orange to the throne, who was very much in favor of the Protestant demands and very much against the Catholics. Um, sort of like in more Necros's uh, camp, I imagine that at some point in English history there were Catholic monarchs. Did they have any... Did Irish Catholics have any different treatment under a Catholic English monarch, or were there no English monarchs that were Catholic, or...? So, there were English Catholic monarchs, and as Assassin said, even um, James II, who was the one that was overthrown by William and Mary, um, was Catholic. And so, and I, I should mention, the, we talk about Ireland because the Irish were mistreated, and we talk about Catholics because Catholics were mistreated. So the Catholic Irish were the most mistreated, but the Catholic English also received their fair share of discrimination. It wasn't as bad because they were still English. And that's why we're not mentioning them as much. But so I, when you're talking about Catholics specifically, um, there were Catholic uh, English monarchs. I know, I think, you know, a lot of us have heard of the switch to, you know, Protestantism for England because of Henry VIII and stuff before that. And frankly, I, I'm not as well versed in that as I should be. Um, I don't know about the switch, but I do know there were Catholic monarchs. And it, it meant that the Catholics and Irish would have probably received a more fair treatment for expressing their religion. But the Catholic English monarchs were still English monarchs, and because of that, the Irish weren't fairly treated because they were being treated like the Irish, who were second, you know, second class in the views of the English, uh, most people from England. So there would have been Catholic monarchs that probably would have been more accepting of Irish religion, uh, but there probably still would not have been a lot of fair policies toward the Irish. Um, uh, one thing. I want to say for the Williamite Wars, because I know Assassin just kind of brought us right on to them, um, and I don't have a ton to say about them, but essentially, uh, as I said a second ago, James was a Catholic, um, and so he had a lot of support uh, amongst the Irish, because they, and it kind of ties into Germany's question, which is like, they assumed, and they were right in some, some amount, uh, you know, if there's a Catholic monarch, oh, and Assassin probably just crashed, so he'll be back in a second, um, uh, you know, with a Catholic monarch, um, you have more fair laws to you as an Irishman, um, or a, a Catholic Irishman. But when James was overthrown by William and Mary, um, the William Mount Wars began. A lot of them were fought in Ireland. Uh, most Irish people fought for James. Most Catholic Irish people fought, fought for James. But the smaller section of the Protestant Irish who were mostly... At this point, they were in the Pale still, but a lot of that was in northern Ireland as well, kind of in Ulster and that area, um, they fought mostly for William's regime. Um, battles went on in Ireland for years. Uh, in the end, the Jacobites were defeated, which was the ones that were for James. Um, and I've been trying to find death statistics to add to this, and that's kind of why I want to keep interjecting. Because it's said that about 100,000 lives were claimed by that war. A lot of those were Irish, because a lot of the battles were in Ireland. So this, in the last 100 years, essentially, for Ireland, there's been 700 on a a, not a conservative estimate, but a, an average estimate, about 700,000 people died in Ireland. Uh, I mean, this is, it's, the Great Famine was awful because a lot of Irish people died, but it's not like that's the only time where a, a lot of Irish people have died because of British issues or English issues. It's, it's a 
pretty common occurrence, it feels like. Um, and then if I, I'm going to continue a little bit into to what went on next. And so, um, Ireland, as Assassin said, be, began to, came, to come back under the crown. Um, the Parliament of Ireland, which had existed for a long time, um, but was in the, you know, existed and controlled the pale, so it was an English uh, system. It was just by Irishmen at that point. Um, the Parliament was majority Protestant. Um, in fact, it was completely Protestant. Catholics had been banned uh, from holding office years before that. Um, in, in 1727, Catholics were uh, essentially completely disenfranchised. They couldn't vote, they couldn't hold office. Um, so in that time and for a long time before, uh, the Parliament had been set up. It's, it's a similar assembly to what Home Rule is asking for in the sense that it was you know, an existing Irish Parliament that was somewhat separate from the English Parliament. Um, despite that, uh, and this is, I wanted to talk about this because I feel like this could be an argument that gets used by our opponents. Uh, when the Parliament of Ireland existed, uh, there was still a large Irish push for separation. Um, and so I feel like our, you know, opponents might say, well, you know, you had home rule once before, and they still wanted to be separate. So that's obvious proof that the Irish are going to want to separate when we, when we get home rule. Um, and I would just like to point out uh, for that that the Irish, despite not being treated completely fairly today, were treated much worse uh, at that point, uh, even just in you know the 1720s than they are now, and well, where we are in the group, which is the 1860s. Um, it was, you know, there were no Catholics in the Irish Parliament, which is a majority of the people. So they were not, not only were they not fairly represented, they weren't represented. Um, so when we have home rule, and they, I mean, they couldn't even vote. So they couldn't vote, and they couldn't even vote to elect the people who they thought might be a little more fair to them. It was, it was simply the Protestants. So the separation was still being pushed for because the Irish were still being abused. Home rule is, is useless if half of the people inhabiting uh, the country can't vote or be fairly represented. Um, and that's the difference of home rule that we want today. And, and we'll do another uh, video later where we talk more about what we want with home rule. But it's definitely a separate issue. When, as the Irish are being granted more and more fair treatment, and we're going to keep pushing with the Home Rule League for fairer treatment for the Irish and for Catholics, Home Rule will be a viable option because all of the Irish will be able to be represented. Um, but I also talk about the Irish Parliament to lead to the Rebellion of 1798. Um, once again, Irish citizens came together in an attempt to reclaim their rights, eventually beaten by the British government. Uh, and once again, I point this out because after the rebellion, all that happened was the death of a lot of Irish people and the English government's attention being turned toward Ireland once again. Um, obviously, Ireland, once the Commonwealth had ended uh, under Cromwell, and that was changed back to the monarchy, Ireland had gone back to following the monarchy as well. But it really doesn't make sense for the English to focus on Ireland when there's still issues with the monarchy in England as well. Uh, but... That kind of gave Ireland some reprieve, uh, although there were still obviously lots of infighting and, and war and things along those lines. But this, uh, in 1798, this rebellion really focused the attention of the English on Ireland once again. And they realized we still have not subjugated these people who we've tried so many times to you know, get rid of all their morale. Um, and so in response to the rebellion, uh, even when the Irish were beaten, the British found a lot of participants of the rebellion, executed them torturing them mercilessly before and that's not just speculation it, it's widely known that they tortured them before executing them um and further in response to this rebellion the little bit of self-governance that ireland had was removed uh after january 1st 1801 which was the act of union uh essentially what happened was the irish parliament was bribed and threatened into voting to abolish itself and essentially put the irish completely under the control of the english parliament now, the Irish did get MPs in the Parliament uh, in Westminster, but it's just not the same. You don't have... There's not even a facade of self-governance if you're not going to allow a Parliament. And so that was what this was. It was basically saying, you've revolted too many times. We're not going to allow you to even act like you're making your own decisions. You're just ours now. Um, now, it's important to point out, a lot of Irish Catholics actually supported the Union. Um... Because under the Union, it had been promised that they would receive emancipation. Uh, even if they couldn't have their own representatives in an Irish assembly, they would be able to vote for their representatives in the English Parliament. Uh, but 
of course, promises to the Irish were broken, as they have been for hundreds of years. And King George III ended up not, uh, like, giving the right to vote to the Irish. Uh, and specifically, the reason was that because he believed it would break his coronation oath to defend the Anglican Church. Uh, now, luckily, King George IV was later persuaded to allow the passage of the Roman Catholic Relief Act in 1829, which allowed British and Irish Catholics to sit in Parliament and, obviously, to vote. Now, obviously, we're in 2021 for this that we're recording, but the group is around 1860. So that means that only about 40 years ago were Catholics even allowed to sit in Parliament and to vote. So this is not a, a, an, old, an old issue at this point. This is something that's still happening to the Catholics and to the Irish. Um, specifically, in 1829, uh, the first person I want to point out is Daniel O'Connell, who was the first Catholic MP to be seated in Parliament since 1689. Uh, so that's a massive amount of time for Catholics to not have had any ability to sit in Parliament. Um, O'Connell also mounted a campaign for the repeal of the Act of Union um, and restorance, uh, restoration apologies, of Irish self-government, um, but obviously we know that that failed. Uh, and discrimination against the Irish and against Catholics didn't just end when they could hold office. Uh, they were still discriminated against, then there was still distrust uh, and grievances that the Irish had with the English because... It's not like allowing one good thing is going to make up for a history of terrible things. And it didn't even fix a lot of the issues that the Irish had with the English. So this is certainly not something that can just be fixed by allowing Irish to sit in Parliament and to be in the Parliament of Westminster. Um, what this does lead me to uh, is something that I really want to talk about before we get to the Great Famine, which will probably be the last thing that we focus on. Um... In, on the 12th of July in 1849, so this was about 20 years after uh, Catholics had finally been able to sit uh, in Parliament and uh, Irish Catholics had been given the right to vote. Uh, and this actually involves our very own Orange Unionists, who are our opposing party, uh, was the Dolly's Bray conflict. Um, so essentially, in Ireland, uh, the, the Orange Unionists set off on a several mile march to display their prowess, the fact that they were... Uh, you know, so strong. There's about 1,200 marchers uh, of the Orangemen. Um, and in response to that march, a large group of Catholics met them uh, in a, on one of the roads they were traveling on, and they were heading to a church. Uh, they were attempting to stop their march. They were armed, uh, but the Catholics did not fight. It was, there, was no, there was no threat of violence. There was a threat of violence, but that was simply it. It was a threat. Uh, it was a, a scare tactic, really, to get their march to end. But uh, the police came and dispersed the Catholics... Um, and allowed the Irish, the Orangemen to continue on their march. Um, and when it ended, they came to the church they were intending to go to. They drank heavily. They gave speeches. Uh, they celebrated the fact that they had, you know, shown how powerful they were to the people of the town they were marching through. And after that, they decided they were going to do the same exact march they had taken to get to the church back to their homes, uh, which was several miles. Uh, once again, the Catholics were waiting in the road for the Orangemen, uh, to attempt to scare them off. Now, there was a shot fired. It's not written who fired the first shot. Uh, I don't know who fired the first shot, and I'm not going to make guesses. But what did happen was each side started shooting at each other. Uh, and right here, I, I really don't think there's any blame to be given. Uh, obviously, the, the Orangemen weren't doing anything inflammatory other than you know showing off their existence and their power that they had in that area. And the Catholics weren't I mean, they were trying to scare them, but they weren't provoking them. So whoever fired that first shot, I really don't know. Without knowing that, we can't really place blame in this situation. But what leads us to being able to place blame is what happened next. Uh, the Catholic, uh, the Catholic people that had assembled were dispersed by the police. Uh, now it's important to point out the Orangemen also had guns, but they weren't dispersed, even though they had been marching for hours at this point. Uh, but the Catholics who had gone there to try and scare them away were dispersed by the police. Uh, and then it led into, as the Catholics were, were running and, and traveling back to their homes, they split up in groups, the Orangemen decided that they weren't done. And so they actually went after the retreating Catholics, proceeded to attack them, uh, to destroy their property. And this led to several fatalities. Um, multiple Irish people died. There were no fatalities among the Orangemen. The Orangemen. Um, but the multiple Irishmen and Catholics died because 
while they had been retreating after being dispersed by the police, they were shot in the back and just merciless killings. Uh, property destroyed, you know, houses burned, and none of the Orangemen were arrested for this. This is the treatment that was allowed to the Irish. You were allowed to kill Irish people, to burn their homes, just for assembling to a counter-protest of... Or not even a counter-protest, to, just to protest a political party. And Irishmen were allowed to be killed, not even in self-defense by the Orangemen. It's just, it's insane to me that this is allowed, and yet people still claim that this isn't uh, just a, a the plot of the Irish that I've mentioned a lot of times in the group wall. This is obviously something terrible, and it really is overlooked because this happens so often to the Irish. But, are you going to, is somebody going to say something I heard of? Yeah. So, uh, I just kind of want to bring up like a no home rule argument. Uh, in the election from, in July of 1865, the Irish, Ireland got about 103 of 658 seats in the House of Commons, which is about 20% of uh, seats in the House of Commons. Um, so what would you say if, uh, in that, if Ireland does have like 20% uh, representation, even though they only have about 8% of the population of the British Isles? That is a great question. I'm sure Assassin would like to say something as well. I'm going to answer it for here, but I'm, I, I'm, I hope people throw in some extra stuff too. Uh, that's actually a good point that we've heard before um, from the Orange Unionists. Um, and it is true, the Irish are overrepresented in Parliament. And I can see how that is considered unfair by the, the Orange Unionists and, and by the English and Scottish. So what I would say to that is the fact that the Irish have 20% representation when they should only have 8, and yet still the laws of the country are pointed and working against the Irish is really an indication that it doesn't matter the amount of representation the Irish have. If they can't make laws for themselves, it's ineffective to give them representation in Westminster. So let's let's say there's there's two possibilities. You either give the Irish 51% of Parliament, you allow them 51% of the seats, and at that point there will be fair laws for the Irish. Because the English and the Scottish and the Welsh even, although they're pretty much England, it is... The fact is, on Great Britain, the island that they're on, they have a lot of the same issues. Uh, Scotland is, is is happy and subjugated under English rule. They're, the, fa the issues they face are the same, and therefore the laws that sustain them are the same. The Irish have different problems, mainly because of the treatment they receive from the English and the Scottish. And so different laws need to be made to be fair for the Irish. But because that's, those aren't prob the problems that the Irish face are not faced by the Scottish and the English. I know that it may seem like that's not true because they're so close and there's only the, you know, the channel that separates them. But the fact is, the laws that they need are different. And the English and Scottish don't care. And it's not like that's a fault of their own. You're going to want laws that help you and your group. And the laws that help the majority, the English and the Scottish, are not helping the Irish. So the only way to have fair laws for Ireland would be to either give the Irish 51% of the seats in Parliament, and of course we know that's not fair, uh, it is, that would be absurd. Uh, it, would, it would mean that there would be no fair laws for the English and the Scottish. But if you don't do that, there's no way to make fair laws except through home rule, because what that will mean is the representation of the Irish in the Imperial Parliament can go back to being 8%. That would be fair, because at that point, we're, it's just throwing in our opinion of what the Irish need in major imperial decisions. Because in the home assembly, in the Irish assembly, the issues that weren't being addressed by the Scottish and English, Irishmen know how to address them because they know what they need. So I think it's a, it's a great question, and I could talk about it for a long time because we've definitely heard that before. But the fact is, the representation in Parliament will never be fair, even if it's over-representing the Irish because that just can't work because they have different issues and assassin if you want to throw anything in there then you can I'm, i know i spoke for a long time but i think that's I, I think you answered that question perfectly honestly that would that was exactly what my point would be is that even though they're technically overrepresented 
they're still not passing the, the the British Parliament still isn't passing the laws that would bring systemic change. Because I talked about this in one of my issues leading up to the potato famine, which I think we can definitely get into more uh, pretty shortly. But a lot of the reform that would be necessary to fix the issues in Ireland, which largely is the land issue, the poverty issue, this would counteract with Britain's goals because Britain has profited immensely from this. With the landlord issue I was talking about, at our current moment in time, 3% of Irish farmers actually own the land they're on. The rest are owned by landlords. They work for landlords and pay insane amounts of rent. Uh, and largely these people are the Protestant elite and the descendants of uh, British settlers in Ireland and not Irishmen themselves. And so the issue with that is all this money is being taken out of Ireland and going into Britain and Ireland has been left starving and uneconomically developed. And so if we were to pass the necessary reforms, this would greatly hurt Britain's economy because Britain, Britain has been gaining so much from this exploitation. And so unless we do get home rule, these insane, these large reforms that Ireland does need simply won't pass. And going off of the question as well, sorry, I didn't mean to cut off that. Uh, it also should be taken with a grain of salt that the northern part of Ireland is largely uh, controlled by the Protestant elite. It's because, and they've been Protestant ever since the establishment of a very large plantation in which the land there was stolen from the Catholics and then uh, made into a giant Protestant uh, plantation. That's a very long story there. But because of that, though they were overrepresented, the party that actually was willing to grant favors to Ireland, the Liberal Party, uh, they only had a small majority of Irish seats. And and that's because uh, a very good amount also went to the Northern Irish who very much did not have the interests of Irish in mind. So even with the overrepresentation, you're not going to see much uh, laws pass in favor of Ireland in the British Parliament. Now, what would you say about other um, parts of the empire with different needs similar to Ireland? Like maybe uh, India, for example. India may be um, an example of a place that maybe needs some self-governance or especially with the Sepoy mutiny, which is actually already uh, in our timeline. Um, what would you say about different colonies who might want um, home rule for the same reasons that Ireland does? Would you say that they also deserve home rule, or do they have a different standard than uh, Ireland does? I might break from my party on this one, because I'm not sure where everyone stands, but I say absolutely. No, I, I say... I completely okay. agree, yeah. I, I think... I'll let Assassin explain, and then I wanna I wanna throw something in as well. So, so you would ahead. subscribe to the sort of a Commonwealth idea, where there's a level of self governance, but it recognizes the monarch as the head of state. I, I can't look up these statistics right now, but everyone at home, go look up statistics on how much cotton was being exported out of India at this time compared to how much they actually were able to keep for themselves. It, it's unbelievable how much the British exploited and uh, took from the India colony. And so I think that the result of that is that India could very well face the same issues Ireland is facing, where their economy is completely exploited and controlled by Britain, and so that the actual native people there are left in absolute poverty. And I think what the more that happens, it, people want to bring up the issue of separation and hostility towards the British. Of course, that's going to happen more if you continue to exploit their population. So I think in this case, if India does get home rule, they'll actually be able to write the economic policies that will actually bring investment and profits of their pr uh, production into the country and end the exploitation. I think that would be better for everyone involved. Absolutely. I completely agree. I want to add some stuff in as well. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think most of us, at least that I've talked to in the Home Rule League, are, are, are tend to agree, especially because you know we've aligned ourselves with the Liberal Party and one of their things is, is greater autonomy for uh, all of the English colonies and and things along those lines. I want to provide an example, and I've used I've used this example on the wall in the group wall before. But there's a, there's such a character restriction there. You can't say you can only have so many characters in your post that I haven't been able to explain it as thoroughly as I'd like. So this is actually a good chance to do that, and that is that I think this kind of follows with what Assassin said, which is that you're going to want have people want separation when you treat them so terribly. Uh, 
And when you don't grant home rule, it actually leads to a greater want for separation. And the example that I'm continuously using for that is the American colonies. Uh, I mean, take a look at the fact that the situation of the Americans was a lot like the one we're having. Obviously, the mistreatment wasn't exactly the same because they hadn't been in the colonies for that long. But the colonists were in a different place than where Parliament is. The distance was greater, the issue is the same. Parliament can't fairly represent what they don't understand, and they don't understand the needs of the Irish, and they didn't understand the needs of the Americans, because it's just a different experience to live there, and they've never experienced that, so they don't know. The Americans had the experience that they did, they recognized that they needed some amount of self-governance, or at least fair representation, and they didn't get that, because Parliament didn't understand. They thought they were doing what was best, and that's part of it as well. The treatment of the English to the Irish has been absolutely awful. But a lot of people in Parliament think they're treating the Irish well when they make some of these laws. They think that it's assisting the Irish. Now, most everyone, I think, generally realizes that what they're doing is, is furthering the goals of the British. But there are some people who make these laws and don't realize that they've failed to make laws that help anyone but them. And that happened to the Americans. The, the laws that were passed hurt the colonists, helped England, and the colonists got angry of it with it and eventually we all know what happened the, the the rebellion in 1776 led to exactly what england doesn't want one of their colonies becoming independent and i think it's a perfect example of the fact that had we granted them fair representation maybe even home rule but even just greater and more fair representation in parliament which they didn't receive the odds are they probably would have been more accepting of english rule they they might still have revolted we don't know but the fact is, if they were happy in the government they had, if they felt safe and they felt assured that they were going to be okay, there's really no need to revolt. You might have gotten some of the radicals, but the the average man who revolted against English rule in 1776 because he felt threatened wouldn't have felt threatened. He wouldn't have needed to, to enter the revolution, and that could have changed everything if the English had just treated their colonies better. And so, yes, I think 100% what Assassin said as well on India is true. The The treatment of the Indians has has been horrendous and continues to be so and first of all it's simply unfair to people that have lived in a place for so long to to come in and assume that we are better than them and to take their things from them but secondly if we do come in and we are going to take over their land it's going to result in problems if we don't recognize the fact that people need to be able to make decisions for themselves to govern themselves and if you give them the ability to do that it doesn't matter who they call king or queen or prime minister or whatever what matters is the fact that they feel safe and comfortable in the system they're in and we can't do that without having self-government and i think that's a great question and it's a sort of even better proof as to why home rule is so necessary um i think next we want to talk about the famine if there's no other questions um assassin. before getting i just want to say before getting go. into that uh, i did get a chance just now to look into a few uh, interesting things about India's treatment. And we're about to talk about the potato famine. Let's say about 80 years ago, India had its own version, a very similar circumstance of uh, the potato famine. While there wasn't actually uh, like a plight or anything, there was a widespread famine that was caused by the British treatments in Bengal, where one third of the population died because of Britain kept depleting the food supply and the money stocks, as well as imposing high taxes. And so I think if you continue to see that sort of treatment, and, and there's no ability for that country to deal with these issues, to deal with the lack of economic growth and development, I think you're going to continue to see more calls for separation because it, you're not going to call for separation if you like the government, like Necker said. You're only going to if you're desperate, if your people have been suffering and starving for generations. And so I think the only way to truly end separation is for there to be a sense of equality, reform, and bring the necessary levels of development to all of the colonies. And I think a happier union will be developed out of that. Absolutely. Uh, I want to kind of yeah, go ahead. touch on the potato famine, more or less, because um, that's actually a topic that I don't know much about. Um, but it is actually very well documented in Mexico because it had a very large impact on us during the Mexican-American War. Um, why 
was it so bad? And I guess my main question is, what was more dangerous to the average to the average Irishman? Is it the blight or the English government in London? What was more dangerous to them? That's well, a... I, before, I, I don't mean to cut you off, Nectars, but yeah, I think there's a great quote that answers that from an Irish historian, which is, God sent the blight, the British caused the famine. What that basically means is that, yes, the blight was what affected the potato crop but the reason that so many people starved is because there was this reliance on potatoes that happened because the irish population had just been so kept out of the economy and so kept in poverty by this oppressive tenant system where essentially what would happen is they would have to give so much of their rent to the uh, british descendant landlords that they could barely afford any proper food and they could barely afford as a country to invest in the necessary things you need for actual development to occur. And so they could only afford the minimum of food. And so they relied so much heavily on the potato crop. And there was just, they were so entrenched in poverty that the situation that Britain caused leading up to the potato famine, as well as the, uh, which I think Necros will go into a lot more, which was the neglect uh, from the British during the actual famine is what caused so many people to die. Uh, yes, sorry, I was still muted on the, uh, the, the stream live. I just had to look up a pronunciation for a quote that I'm going to use, um, and so I want to go into that. Uh, absolutely right, Assassin. I think that quote is, is perfect. Um, and it kind of follows into what I was about to say, uh, which is, the Great Famine was obviously very awful, and the potato blot is exactly what caused the potatoes to die. That, that's obviously well understood. But, despite the blot killing a lot of the crops in Ireland, Ireland still produced a net positive of potatoes. So had the Irish been allowed to disperse the potatoes amongst themselves and their clan and familiar relationships that a lot of them had, the problem would not have been as bad as it was. The, the actual, the, the famine, the Great Famine was exacerbated by the fact, first of all, that as Assassin said, the Irish were essentially drained of, of all their money. They, they either lived in these tiny these tiny farms that had been the only farms they had left in the west of Ireland, which wasn't great for growing food. Uh, tiny small amounts. And, and also, it should be pointed out, uh, it was a tradition to give sons equal shares of a farm when their father died. So this meant that pretty much every generation with multiple children, the size of these farms was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, at this point, none of the Irish were farming to make money. This was subsistence farming. This was to stay alive. And the fact is, there was nothing else to grow but potatoes. They couldn't grow... They couldn't afford to buy food for themselves. As Assassin said, that was out of the question. They gave all of their money to the English. So they couldn't afford to buy food. And they couldn't spend the time to grow other crops. You can't grow an entire garden on a small tract of land that's going to feed your entire family. Uh, it's just... You, you couldn't do it. The amount of land that they had to grow on, it was too small. It would take too much work. And so what they did was they grew potatoes. Potatoes were high on carbs easy to grow. They don't have to have a lot of work. They grow pretty much wherever, as long as their plant didn't have water. Uh, and they could feed an entire family very easily. So most Irishmen grew them. Uh, grew them. So when the blot hit, they lost the only crop that they had to sustain themselves. And, and this is where I was getting into what I said a minute ago. A lot of the crops were ruined, but as I said, they still produced a net positive. And this is another cause that the English had to make the blot worse, and this was the other one I wanted to get into, which is most of the the potatoes grown by the Irish were exported to England. So, so yes, and this was something I, one of the, the Irish Unionists said a couple days ago, was that, well, the blood also affected Scotland, and, you know, they didn't, it wasn't as bad for them, so, I, I, you know, how could it be that it was so bad for the Irish, and whatever it was his argument was, is, yes, the, the potato blood did affect Ireland, or England and Scotland, but they also had the money to buy other food, they were able to grow other crops than potatoes, and so their people simply did not starve. If they did, it was it was in the thousands. The Irish could only grow potatoes, and yet the English still shipped those out to England and Scotland. So the English and Scottish stayed alive during this potato famine by eating the potatoes that the Irish needed to survive. So yes, the blight was terrible. Uh, but... It was the treatment by the English that caused the blot to be so terrible. If the English had stayed out of Ireland and just allowed them to, to, to continue without the, these terrible policies uh, that they had, it, 
the, the famine probably wouldn't have killed that many people. Um, and so I, I actually found a quote uh, regarding the famine. Reverend Dr. Nicholas McAvoy, uh, parish priest of Kells, which is a town in like lower northeast Ireland, like in the middle of east of Ireland, uh, said, and this is a, little bit, a bit of a longer quote, but it's not too, super long, so you have to forgive me. Um, it says, On my most minute personal inspection of the potato crop in this fertile potato-growing locale is founded my inexpressibly painful conviction that one family in 20 of the people will not have a single potato left on Christmas Day next. Uh, and this was said in, Oct uh, like, late October, so not a long time. Uh, Many are the fields I have examined, and the testimony that most solemn can I tender that in the great bulk of those fields all the potatoes sizable enough to be sent to table are irreparably damaged, while for the remaining comparatively sounder fields very little hopes are entertained in consequence of the daily rapid development of the deplorable disease. With starvation at our doors, grimly staring us, vessels laden with our sole hopes of existence, our provisions are hourly wafted from our every port. From one milling establishment, I have last seen not less than 50 dray loads of meal moving on to Drogheda, thence to go to feed the foreigner, leaving starvation and death the sure and certain fate of the toll and sweat that raised this food. For their respective inhabitants, England, Holland, Scotland, and Germany are taking early the necessary precautions, getting provisions from every possible part of the globe. And I ask, are Irishmen alone unworthy the sympathies of a paternal gentry or a paternal government? Let Irishmen themselves take heed before the provisions are gone. Let those, too, who have sheep and oxen and haggards. Self-preservation is the first nature, or the first law of nature. The right of the starving to try and sustain existence is a right far away and paramount to every right that property confers. Infinitely more precious in the eyes of reason, in the adorable eye of the omnipotent creator, is the life of the last and least of human beings than the whole united property of the entire universe. The appalling character of the crisis renders delicacy but criminal and imperatively called Delicacy, but criminal and imperatively calls for the timely and explicit notice of the principles that will not fail to prove terrible arms in the hands of a neglected, abandoned, starving people. So that was a long quote, but it's also very powerful. This man, a priest who had who, who had known these people of his town for his entire life, likely he had been preaching to them for years, uh, is experienced the people that he knows, and basically saying that a large amount of people will not have a single potato left in about two months. And not only that, the potatoes that they are growing are irreparably damaged in most farms. But the farms that do have potatoes that are actually growing well, those ones are getting shipped out to foreigners. So so it, it's like it's like the, the blight happened and it would have been terrible for the Irish. It would have been terrible on its own. A lot of people would have died. But it's like the needs of the Irish were completely ignored to ship out to everyone else that could possibly be affected by the famine and simply the Irish were allowed to starve and I think that quote was just extremely extremely uh, moving and I thought it was very powerful um, and the last thing I want to cover now and we're coming to the end here and we're gonna do another video on home rule and the policies although I am gonna do a little bit of covering you know what home rule is going to fix for that just to, to have a little bit of explaining what our policies are but before we do that uh, I just wanted to read the statistics of, of the death um, between 1845 and 1855, no less, uh, or, or sorry, I started a little bit too late, I should say, or, uh, during the Great Hunger, about one million people died and more than a million fled the country, causing the population of Ireland to fall by 20 to 25 percent. In some towns, the population fell as much as 67 percent between 1841 and 1851. Between 1845 and 1855, no less than 2.1 million people left Ireland, primarily on packet ships, but also steamboats and barks, one of the greatest mass exoduses from a single island in history. So, imagine the town that you live in. The town that I live in now has 10,000 people in it, which is a pretty small town, really, all things considered. And it's saying that the, the, the population of some of these towns in Ireland fell by 70 percent and that's including deaths and people who fled so imagine your town that would mean that there would only be about three thousand people left in my town and of course that's still a lot of people but then consider the size of even the biggest places in the 1860s of course places like london had millions of people but ireland doesn't have any major maybe dublin but most of these towns and cities were groups of families that had lived there for generations and 67 percent of those people were just gone most of them fled a lot of them dead 
and that's simply because of the the tenets and the, the the policies of the English. Now, the reason I say I wanted to talk about politics is because I think it's important to, and you're probably going to roast me on my pronunciation of laissez-faire, laissez-faire. I don't, I still don't know what the correct pronunciation is. Laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is what I've always said. I've, I looked it up and it was different from some people. But whatever it is, the policies are the same. And a lot of people are going to say, you know, how can the Home Rule League support laissez-faire economics while also complaining that the Irish died from the famine? Because a lot of what people are going to see is the fact that the, the English didn't fairly respond to the famine. But the Home Rule League isn't saying that the English should have come in and given us a bunch of handouts. We're not, we're not saying that we're pro-handout and, and, and the, you know, the, we're still in support of allowing Ireland to have its own successes and failures. The problem is, Ireland wasn't allowed to have its own failure. The failure of in, in the famine wasn't Ireland's. If the, the famine had been by failed Irish policies, then certainly the situation would be different. But that's not what we're discussing. We're not discussing handouts by the government being the failures of the English. We're discussing the failures of the English being the fact that the famine was allowed to happen because of their policies. So, so don't take this as the Home Rule League saying that we're... We support laissez-faire unless we're in trouble, in which case we want handouts from the British, because that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that we would have never been in need of those handouts in the first place if the English wouldn't have butted into a system that they can't understand to pretty irreparably hurt an economy that simply did they simply did it just to benefit themselves. So I think it's important to point that out, because it, it can sound contradictory to complain about this and then say that our economic policy is, is supporting free trade and allowing successes and failures. But it's not contradictory because the issue isn't handouts; it's why the handouts were needed. So I think that was really important to clarify because I've heard that before. So I have um, sort of one more citation, uh, yeah. maybe. Um, so the Irish Famine Curriculum Committee, very long name, but they said that uh, the government Ireland previously had actually experienced famines um, before the Great Famine, nothing on the scale, but um, still enough to where the English government needed to step in. They said that when Ireland had experienced food shortages from 1782 to 83, ports were closed to keep Irish-grown food in Ireland to feed the hungry, and Irish food prices promptly dropped. So merchants lobbied against the export ban, but the government in the 1700 in the 1780s overrode their protest. Um, so the way I read that is kind of the English government just saying, "Keep your food, and that's it." Um, in the 1780s, but not doing the same in this period of history, uh, 1840s, I believe, is when uh, yeah. the famine had started. So, um, to sort of back up your laissez-faire approach, the government not stepping in and only saying, just keep your food, we don't want any more, um, actually did more for uh, Ireland than uh, the government coming in and giving out a handout. Which... I don't think the English government ever actually did give a hang out, handout, ever, really, to they, uh, the Irish. They did, but they openly admitted that it was the bare necessity. Not even the, it was yeah. less than the bare necessity. It was, it was, they, they shipped in grain when Ireland's economy was so underdeveloped that there was no mills. So they literally couldn't do anything with the grain. There's actually a common trend where they would eat this grain, but they couldn't digest it properly because it hadn't been milled. So it would just completely destroy their system, and it was probably worse than just eating nothing. But, yeah, so it, it, the help really didn't do much. And actually, I have an interesting quote from the person who was in charge of uh, administrating help and aid and relief to the Irish, which uh, he said, hang on, give me one sec. His name was Sir uh, Charles Trevelyan. And again, he was in charge of doling out relief to the Irish, and he says, the famine had been sent by God to teach the Irish a lesson, a lesson. The real evil which we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, preserve, and turbulent character of the people. Which this goes into a lot of anti-Irish sentiment that the uh, British had, where basically Ireland was a colony at this point. And in almost every case of colonization, you'll see a common trend where people justify their oppression and horrible policies and treatment by calling the Irish, or by, by calling their subjects backwards and savages, and you can say, oh, well, it doesn't matter if we oppress them, they're not even human, they're subhuman. 
and this is exactly what we're hearing in Trevelyan's case. He says that the evil isn't the people dying. The issue isn't the blight that's killing them. The issue is that the Irish are uh, backwards or savages. And I think that definitely sums up a lot of the British expression. They didn't want to help Ireland because they viewed the Irish as this really underdeveloped, poor, backwards place that didn't deserve any sort of help from the from the British. That That's very true. And I want to throw something in here that I just remembered. I talked about these in the manifesto that we wrote, uh, and then I forgot to, uh, to talk about them here. And I just looked them up again. Uh, which is the Corn Laws in Ireland. Um, and so this is this is me basically reading a, an, an excerpt. This isn't just my own speak, but it says, Food prices in Ireland were beginning to rise, and p potato prices had doubled by December 1845. Meanwhile, the Irish grain crop was being exported to Britain. Uh, public meetings were held, and prominent citizens called for exports to be stopped and for grain to be imported as well. Uh, however, this would have meant repealing the Corn Laws, and there was great uh, opposition in Britain to this. So essentially, the Corn Laws were an exception to the doctrine of laissez-faire, they laid down that large taxes had to be paid on any foreign crops brought into Britain. Uh, this kept grain prices high, and the British traders would lose profits if the laws were repealed. Uh, since the Act of Union made Ireland legally a part of the uh, United Kingdom, its corn crop could be moved to England without incurring the tax. So there was no tax on the Irish crop going to England. However, corn crops brought into Ireland to relieve the famine were taxed. So those were, had to be paid more for to be brought into Ireland from England, which made them less affordable. Um, because they had to pay more for them once they were, you know, set out. Uh, and it says Prime the Prime Minister Peel said, uh, pushed through a repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, uh, which split the Tory party, and he was forced to resign. So in an actual attempt to help Ireland by continuing, you know, actual laissez-faire economics and allowing the trade to go as it should have been without these insane unfair taxes on the Irish, uh, he had to resign just for simply trying to help the Irish. And they actually quoted him uh, in a speech he made to Parliament before resigning. They said, Good God, are you to sit in a cabinet and consider and calculate how much diarrhea and bloody flux and dysentery a people can bear before it becomes necessary for you to provide them with food? So this is, so Assassin is absolutely right, uh, is that a lot of the food coming in couldn't be used. And a lot of the food that could have come in couldn't be bought because it was taxed so heavily against the Irish. They couldn't afford to buy it because of how expensive it had to be. So... I just wanted to throw that in there because I think the Corn Laws are, are, were a, a huge hurt to Ireland. And it's just another example of the fact that they were allowed to take Irish crops, send them to England, and not tax them, which meant less money was made to the Irish than it was taken from. Uh, and yet they had to pay more in Ireland for crops from England because those could be taxed. So I think that's a bit absurd. Yeah, and going off that on the idea of the laissez-faire, however you want to pronounce it, uh, laissez-faire economics... Ireland was not a free economy by any sense of the word. It was not a free economic place where Catholics could freely compete with uh, Protestants over their land. They had their land stolen from them. So they were completely exploited and oppressed and forced into this tenant system that caused their poverty. They weren't in poverty because of free market. So I, in my personal opinion, I think what made the famine so bad was because of the tenant system that put Catholics in this abject, horrible system of poverty where they had no ability to afford food, no ability to improve. And, 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 and that's, and because of that, sorry, uh, it really wasn't a free market system because the reason for this really horrible tenant system was not the free market. It was because of the British governments putting laws into place that prevented Catholics from even owning land, from them having their land confiscated. As mentioned before, despite, before the Cromwellian rule, the Catholics held most of the land and they were doing pretty well with their farming. What really, the whole issue of the poverty and relying on the potato and all the sort of things that caused the famine to be as bad as it was, didn't start happening until the British government started putting oppressive laws on the Catholics that took their land. So I think we've been going for about an hour and 10 minutes now. And I think we've gotten through most of what we wanted to talk about. Uh, so I, I just want to, to finish this by kind of covering what we've stated and why it's such an important point, and they are important points for home rule. So the first thing uh, that we talked about, and just kind of in the early history, is the amount of times that Ireland has rebelled. We didn't even cover all of them. There are multiple rebellions that I didn't talk about, uh, because I kind of only mentioned the ones. I didn't want to talk specifically about wars, more as, you know, what things that had happened to the Irish. 
so I didn't mention a lot of the ones that were just regular rebellions, but there was a lot of them. Uh, and it's pretty consistent that each time there was a rebellion, it was because there were more and more repressive policies put in place by the English. So the first thing that we can recognize through our discussion is that the more repressive to the Irish that the English are, the greater the want for separation. Home rule, which is the exact opposite of that, would mean that separation was less necessary. As I said, we can talk, we can look at the, the Americans who were not, you know, granted the, the representation they needed and it led to separation. Home rule is attempting to stop that. So the, the, the OUP trying to argue that home rule is going to lead to separation is, is simply a statement made without proof. And history actually shows that the more freedoms given to the Irish will probably lead to less want for separation. So we talked about that. We talked about the treatment of the Irish. If the fact that it's less separation and less want for separation doesn't convince you on its own, it should simply convince you to the fact that the Irish have been thoroughly mistreated for hundreds of years. It's it's terrible the way that they they're second class citizens. They they there's been signs out and and this was right after the famine when a lot of Irish fled to to England and a lot of them to America. A lot of them uh, in England would encounter signs that said, you know, uh, we are hiring or you know workers wanted no Irish need apply or no Catholics need apply. Uh, it it was they were mistreated for, for ages. And at the point that we're in in history, 1860s, they were still being mistreated. This is why the Home Rule League is so important, because we're addressing those problems. So Home Rule will lead to less need for separation. That's one reason. Home Rule will lead to fairer treatment for the Irish and for Catholics, who are at this point not treated fairly. So that's reason number two. And the third is that Home Rule will lead to a stronger empire and that kind of goes into less want for separation but also economically allowing the irish to have their own economic decisions to to trade with who they want to trade with and that leads into our policies of free trade that we'll talk about maybe in the next video we do when we talk about our specific policies but allowing the irish to trade freely with to, to trade on a on an equal level with the english it's not fair for the english to have an advantage every time they get food from ireland but yet ireland is hurt when they get food from england that should be equal, and Ireland should be able to trade with anyone else on an equal basis. Uh, and that will strengthen Ireland's economy, and therefore strengthen the Union. Because I think it, this is something that the the OUP has said, that they recognize how important Ireland is. But if that were the case, then they would want to enforce and to create these laws. Because Ireland, at this point, in the 1860s, in the Home Rule League stance, is that the Empire is important for Ireland. At this point as long as no more oppressive policies are made, the Empire does provide some amount of safety for Ireland. And so that's why the Home Rule League isn't an, a, a, a separationist or a separatist uh, group. But there needs to be change, and that's what the Home Rule League is bringing, and that's why it's so important, because while the Empire is important for Ireland, Ireland is also a valuable part of the Empire. And that needs to be recognized and admitted by the people and by the candidates for parliament and when it is i think it makes it all the more clear that home rule is extremely important or home rule is extremely important so that's essentially what i wanted to talk about um i think maybe in a week or so we can have another discussion uh, uploaded to youtube this one about specific policies of the home rule league once uh, but this was essentially this video and hopefully if anyone is still watching it will have enlightened you to how terribly the irish were treated this is not some, obviously we're doing this in 2021 uh, because we enjoy the idea of having these, these political discussions and things along those lines, but we've also joined the sides that we truly support. And the fact is, in real life, millions of Irish people died because of British treatment, because of English treatment. And so if there's a party and you're an EBI that you're going to support, it simply makes sense. If you care about the Irish, you should support Home Rule. And that's why this video is important. Uh, that's all I had. Um, I appreciate Germany coming today. I think the questions he asked were very good, and I hope that some of the questions that he asked were questions that you might have come up with as we were discussing things. Uh, but if there were questions that you do have that were not answered, please feel free to comment them, because I enjoy answering them, and I also think it's important to answer them, because you all need to be able to understand why Home Rule is so important. So if you have any questions, please leave them. Ask us in-game, ask us on 
Roblox messages, ask us in YouTube comments, wherever you ask them will be fine, so feel free to ask them. Uh, Absolutely. And I uh, know Assassin will be happy to answer them as well, so either of us, you can message, uh, and I think that is all I had. So Germany, I appreciate it. Assassin, I appreciate no it. Uh, I hope you learned something, Germany, for our hour of talking about Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope that someone who is watching learned something, and hopefully we will be back in about a week uh, to discuss specific home rule policies. So... Thank you very much, guys, and that will be all. Thank you. Bye, guys.